Good morning, everybody. Hope you're awake now. Hope you're ready to get in the Word. Uh, if you have your Bibles, please flip them open to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're continuing <clears throat> to go through this passage that I've been going through the previous two services. So uh, I've been doing a different sermon every service, focusing in on this passage of 1 Corinthians 13, discussing the importance of faith, hope, and love. So first service we did faith, second service we did hope, and now we are talking about love, which is the most important topic. Uh, The other two merely uphold the importance of love. So let's read the relevant passages. This starts in verse 8. And it says, Love never fails, or another way to translate that is love never ends. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, We prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but when I shall, then I shall know just as I am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. It is wise beyond anything man can ever create. So as we study it, as we are informed by it, we pray that you would elevate us, that you would help us to see things beyond our natural gaze, that you would be able to help us reflect on our relationships with others, and more importantly, our relationship with you. Allow these words to sink deep, to move us, to change us into people who are more like you, Uh, May we love you more at the end of this, and in your name, amen. So, uh, Scott's up in Saurita, and he asked me to teach here today, which I'm always happy to do. It's uh, it's always a great joy and blessing for me. And as I was praying about what to teach on, this passage kind of jumped into my mind, uh, mainly because of everything that's going on in the world right now. Um, If you're not aware of how chaotic things are, I envy your naivety. (laughs) Ignorance is truly bliss. There are a lot of crazy things going on right now. And um, when the world is in such turmoil and we're focusing as a church about what we want God to do and what we believe God has the power to do, we we serve an all-powerful, sovereign God who sits in the heavenly places and does everything he pleases. And we're sitting in this turmoil, we can ask and we say, what is the thing that God wants us to do? What is, where is he moving? Where does he want to move that we could be a part of it? And Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and they've, they've given themselves over to a lot of exceptional things. They've, they've really focused in on the more supernatural and uh, grandiose aspects of the Holy Spirit things like prophecy, tongues, and things like that. Not that these things aren't important, and Paul never says they're not, but he says they've elevated these things to the expense of what's most important, what matters the most. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 12, when he's talking about the gifts, he says, hey, these things are great, and we should earnestly desire the best gifts, yet I will show you a more excellent way. And then he starts talking about love. And so in in the first two sermons, as I said, I went through what faith is, what hope is, how it leads us, how it guides us. But love really is the main topic. And you can see it from the context of the passages I just read. Because the whole point is he's saying everything else in this world, everything will eventually fade away. And the only thing that's going to remain is love. Now, when he says abide these three, faith and hope, you have to understand faith and hope will go away. Faith and hope will go away. For one day we will see God and faith will be replaced with sight. There will be no reason to trust in him because we will be able to know him as we are fully known. We'll be in his presence itself. There's no reason to hope for that which you already have. The greatest hope of the Christian is the hope for heaven, the hope to be united with God forever and ever. And when we're in heaven, there will be no reason to hope anymore because we will have it. That which our hearts greatly desire will finally be present when we go to see God. But love, love is the only true eternal blessing of God. It is something that will survive the collapse of every government, the collapse of every system. 
It'll survive your death and my death and even the death of this world. Love will remain. And he's saying, if God is going to move in us, if we're going to be a church or a people of power and might, we will be a people of love. That if you become a more loving person, if you become more in line with God's perfect love, that is a miracle that is greater than someone prophesying. It's greater than someone performing any miracle, even, dare I say, raising someone from the dead. It is the most amazing and miraculous thing that God could ever do. But we've been so obsessed with sensationalism. Some of us, when I say that, you're like, yeah, but the other stuff's kind of cool too, right? You know, like maybe we should, if God wanted to move, maybe he would do more stuff like that. Maybe he would do more miraculous things. Why wouldn't he? And again, God can do what he wants and he has and he will do many miraculous things in your life and my life. But God will also say no to a lot of miracles in your life and my life. But the one miracle, the one thing that he will never say no to is love. Us receiving his perfect love and us us being able to grow within it. That is what is at stake. Now, I have to answer this question of what, what do we mean by love? love? Love is one of those things that's very misunderstood, especially in our culture. Uh, different cultures have seen it in different ways. Other cultures are more, uh, they're more personal, they're more uh, familial and things like that. And so when they define love, they define love as being merely actions, So doing kind, generous, and sacrificial things for others. Other cultures are more emotional, and so they define love emotionally. So if they were to say, do you love this person? They would ask the question, well, I don't know. I I don't really get the the butterflies or anything like that, so I'm not really sure if I love them or not. Um, And our culture is a lot like that. But there's also an additional aspect to it where I think that if you were to ask someone, if if you were to put an action or an attitude on love, I think that our culture would probably say tolerance. We would say, if, if I'm a loving person, I am accepting, I am totally accepting and tolerant of everything that someone else is doing. That's how I demonstrate love. But they would still also define it based upon um, this idea of emotions. Other people would also look at the idea or the concept of love and say, well, it's kind of like a, it's a very abstract concept. You know, it's not very concrete for everybody. Uh, it looks different for different people in different times and in different ways. I know it when I experience it, but I don't really know how to define it. Now, all this confusion, and all this difficulty with love is normally it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But the reason why it is a big deal is because love is one of the greatest things within the Bible. Jesus says it's the greatest command that when people challenge him, what's the greatest command? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as, it's, uh, as, as yourself. A lot of people in our culture agree with Jesus. We would say, yeah, love is the prime directive. It is the number one thing we should be growing in. If everybody loved more, the world would be a better place. But here's the thing. If you set something up as the supreme virtue, yet you misdefine it or fail to define it, you may be setting people up for a lot of abuse and mistreatment. In fact, if we were to go around the room and ask ourselves the question, who are the people in your life that have hurt you the most? I'd be willing to bet they're the people who claimed loved you the most, the people you let in the most, the people you trusted the most. If I were to ask you who are the people you've hurt the most, once again, I would be willing to bet that it's the people that you loved the most. Because love is so vulnerable and because love is so powerful, it is rife with temptations of abuse and mistreatment. And you will never be hurt more than by the person who claims that they love you. So we have to be careful. If we're going to set up love as a supreme virtue, we better be ready to define it. So we can say, this is love and that is not. I don't care if you say you're loving this person or you're loving me. That's not love. Or I don't care what I feel I ought to do to you. I only care what love really is, and I need to be in keeping with that framework. We have to be people that are led by something concrete, or else love will cause more damage than hate. So, we go through 1 Corinthians 13. What we see is we see a framework for love. It's not meant to be an exhaustive description. 
but it is meant to show us a very beautiful sketch or tracing of how love operates in our day-to-day lives. And this is what we need to be focusing on. Before we get into this, though, I wanted to evaluate a couple things. The first one is Matthew 24, verse 12. You don't have to flip there. I'm just going to quote it for you guys. This is Jesus speaking of the last days. And he says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. I don't know where you stand on believing um, when Jesus is returning. I, I tend to believe he's close. And one of the reasons why I tend to believe he's close is because as a history buff, as someone who really likes studying world history, I can't tell you of another society or another age in which love has become more cold. And Jesus says that this will happen, that love will grow cold. And instead of love, in the place of love, there will be dissension, divisiveness, hatred, argumentation, and strife. And again, if you don't see that around you, I would be happy to exchange my negativity for your naivety. The world has become a very cold place. We've become very divided. We've become very hateful and vengeful. You know, as a, as a marriage counselor, I could, I could tell you that this is the number one thing I look for within a marriage. So if I sit down with a couple and I want to gauge where they're at, you know, want to gauge where they're at on a scale of like one to 10, you know, one being we're going to divorce tomorrow, 10 being we've never been happier. Usually what I'm looking for is I'm looking for this idea. How much do you guys love one another? And I don't base that on the arguments. There are some couples I look at and be like, you're misguided. You're ignorant to each other's feelings. But at the bottom of everything, you really genuinely do care about one another. And they might be having the fieriest arguments ever. They might be screaming bloody murder at one another. But at the end of the fight, they go to the same room, they sleep in the same bed, and there is a love there. There's a respect there. It's not really seen at the the peak of the emotions, but there is an underlying care that could be seen within them. The couples I worry the most about is when I start to see contempt. Contempt. And contempt is at odds with love. Contempt is not merely disagreeing about something, even passionately disagreeing with uh, with someone about something. It's personal attack built upon bitterness and hatred. So let me give you an example. Let's say you have a couple, and one of them forgot to do something with a child. Let's say they forgot to pick them up from school or something like that. Now, an argument is warranted in that circumstance. Anger is warranted in that particular circumstance. So if a couple gets into an angry argument, I'm not really too worried about that. But if at any point in the argument, it turns from arguing about what happened and why they're upset, and it starts inflecting and morphing and shifting into personal, vicious attacks, that's when I know love is in short supply. It's growing cold. So instead of saying, I can't believe you forgot our son, like, what were you doing? I I don't understand, and getting mad and yelling, they move and say, this is so like you. You only think about yourself. You see the shift? I'm no longer mad about what they did. I'm taking what they did, and I'm using that as an example for how horrible they are as a person. I'm attacking them as an individual now. In the same way in our culture, Hey, political disagreement's been alive since politics has been around. People say things were better back in the day. They're not saying that politics was more civil. I mean, uh, literal duels were fought over politics back in the day. People died for what they believed in back in the day over things that we would think of as being kind of stupid. But what you didn't see to the level that you see today is a mass demonization of the other side. It's not just we disagree. It's we disagree because you're fundamentally evil. You want people to die. That's why you believe this. It's not, hey, we disagree about what the proper course of action is, and I believe that what you're doing is more dangerous. It's inferring motive. It's inferring malice. Saying, I believe you're wicked, and that's why you believe this. That is when things have taken a sharp turn. 
And bringing any relationship back from contempt is almost impossible. I've been a marriage counselor for about 10 years now, and I'll tell you, once a couple gets here, which is usually when they come and talk to me, once they get here, about 70 to 80% of them will not make it. They will divorce. Because, man, it's hard to forgive those ugly, evil things that have been said over years and years of contempt. It's hard to respect someone who's mistreated you like that. And it's hard to overcome those feelings of hurt. Once a couple gets there, it's very unlikely that they'll recover. It's because their love is growing cold. Very cold. We have to be careful that that doesn't happen to us. So let's break this down. Paul starts, he begins his passage on love, so we'll read through this. And uh, this is going to be a bare overview. Uh, There's so much I could talk about here. I could do like 20 sermons here. This is going to be just a bare overview, hopefully give you a good um, starting point when you're reading and discovering this passage. The first one is that we see, and this is 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3. We're going to discover the importance of love, the supremacy of it, the profit of love, what it gains us or garners us. And finally, we're going to see the source of love, how we get it. So let's read the passages. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so as I could remove mountains, have not love, I am nothing. And although I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So let's talk about the supremacy of love. Paul looks at this person, this uh, hypothetical individual, and they seem to have every blessing that anyone could ever want. And not only do they have every blessing that anyone could ever want, they're willing to give these things to others. Who wouldn't want the wisdom to understand everything, every mystery? If God came to you today and said, hey, I'm going to give you the gift to understand everything that's happening in your life, you're going to have the wisdom to make the right decision in every circumstance, Who would sneer at that? Who would be like, eh, couldn't you give me more? Isn't there more? No, that's like the greatest possible blessing. If you had the talent, I mean, sometimes when we listen to people sing that have great talent, like when we do worship here in service and you listen to to Dave or these other people, you're like, wow, like it's, it almost makes you in awe. And it makes you like, gosh, I suck. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) You're just like, you know, I, I, I sound terrible. You know, it puts you, it puts you humble a little bit. But I mean, to have a voice, like to have a musical gift and talent that's so unbelievable and supernatural that even angels would shy away. Who would want that? Right? That's amazing. And then finally, to be such a generous person that you were willing to give everything to the poor. You hold nothing sacred. you're, You're so generous in giving that you're willing to give everything to everyone else, even your life. And finally, to have faith that is so powerful and rooted in God that no matter what obstacles are in your way, you could remove mountains. You are so faithful. You are calm and at peace with no anxiety and distractions. Who wouldn't want that? And yet Paul says, if you have all of that and you're doing all of this and you don't have love, you're nothing. It's nothing. That all the amazing things that we pray for, that if God were to give you a miraculous gift to heal anyone you touched, if you could say the right thing in every circumstance, if everything in your life started to turn around and every blessing was afforded to you, Paul would say you could have all of that, and if you lack love, it's nothing. It's empty, vacuous, and hollow. One of the fundamental needs of humanity, and it's something that our culture really struggles with, is love. Love. You can endure almost anything. And if you have love, if you are known by others, you really feel like other people understand you and you understand them and there's care and there's mutuality and there's affection and respect, you can undergo any trial. One of the most physically tormenting periods of my life was going to Afghanistan. And yet, I don't think I've ever felt more loved by a fellow person. We really got one another. We really understood. We were willing to die for one another. And it wasn't words and it wasn't theory. 
We really did risk our lives for one another. And that love, that affection, it made a terrible circumstance bearable. But the other token, I have never been, I was never suicidal in Afghanistan, but you know what? I've been suicidal here in the States. And it's always come at moments where I feel alone, misunderstood, undervalued, and even the real dark nights of the soul, where I believe I'm actually damaging those around me by being alive. You see, I could have every blessing, but if love isn't a part of what I, what I have, if that's not a part of my treasury, then I am truly an impoverished man. I have nothing. And that moves to the reward of love. Some people believe that to be loving means that you're so selfless that you never feel good about what you're doing. So they, they drum up this religiosity, this perspective of these stoic people doing kind things to others, but never feeling good about it. In fact, they, they hate it. They're like, yeah, I'm doing this, but this is terrible. Reminds me of an episode of Friends. I like that show. I don't care. Uh, there's an episode of Friends where, where Phoebe becomes convinced that there's no such thing as a selfless, loving uh, action because everything you do that's nice, someone else, you, you benefit from it. And her finally supreme act of love that she does is she says, um, well, she first, she says that she lets a bee stinger. <laughs> And she says, well, you know, it hurt me, but, you know, the bee now gets to look tough in front of his bee friends. And her friends are like, well, yeah, that's great, but the bee probably died. And so she feels bummed about that. So then finally she gives a lot of money to an organization she hates. And she's like, well, you know, it's, it's certainly a loving act because I hate this organization, but I know people will benefit from it, so I'm selfless. And I think a lot of people in the church and in relig religious circles, they think that way, that to be loving would mean that you're not you don't feel good about what you're doing. But what the Bible says that love is so beautiful. It's so amazing. It's so incredible that the person who's acting in love is actually more benefited and prosperous than anyone else. Jesus said, it is better to give than to receive. Right? He could have said, hey, it's worse to give than to receive, but you have to do it because God says so. But he didn't say that. He said, it's better. It's better to sacrifice what you have for another than to hold on to what you have selfishly and die alone. It's better. As a parent, you know, as a, as a new dad, I'll tell you, loving my child that could give me nothing in return, nothing in return, has been some of the most joyous moments of my life. It really is better to give than to receive. It's really better. And that's why Paul talks about the prophet. Have not love, it profits me nothing. I have nothing. There's a prophet to love. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. We shouldn't feel bad about feeling good. In fact, when we're loving someone, we're the only people in the universe that are truly acting out of self. Because our joy and our happiness is rooted in the happiness of the beloved. That's why we're so happy. There are selfish reasons to profit from love. I could do a good thing to you expecting a good in return. That's selfish. I could do a good to you to feel more proud and arrogant about who I am. Look at what a loving person I am that I've given this money to this cause or this charity. So there are negative reasons, but when you're abiding in the correct reason, the non-mercenary reason of truly, genuinely seeking the good of the beloved above all other things, there is no greater joy. There is no greater joy. That's why when you look at this generation, it shocks a lot of people. This generation struggles with more anxiety and depression than any other generation before it, and yet it has some, uh, some of the greatest advantages and prosperity that anyone, any people group throughout human history have ever enjoyed. Why are they so bummed out? It's because, and I could go on and on about this, it's because we thought, right, the older generation thought, I'm going to give you everything I never had. Everything I never had, I'm going to give to you. I'm going to make sure you never have to sacrifice. And you know what they, you did? You took away the number one joy in the universe from that person without realizing it. You substituted the greatest blessing with mere bread and water. And you're amazed that this person who you've never asked to sacrifice for you has become miserable, self-entitled, and anxious above all else. 
it's interesting that the cultures that ask the most from their young have the young that are most pleased. The cultures who ask the least from their young have the most aimless, self-obsessed, and self-hating generation. It's weird and it's antithetical to what we would think, but it's also obvious if we understand what Jesus said. Is it really better to give than to receive? Is it better to give your child everything and demand nothing from them? Or is it better to still train them to be able to give selflessly to others? To sacrifice? Because that's their greatest joy. Not you taking care of their external needs, but you taking care of their most important and endearing internal one. That they learn how to sacrifice. And that will make them happy. You know, there's so much I can say about this. I'll, I'll just add this one last thing. That's what, in this generation, there's, there's weird stuff going on, man. I'll, I'll just throw it out there. It's weird. The fact that the marriage rate, you know, some people were like, man, the divorce rate's at an all-time low. Well, it's because the marriage rate's at an all-time low. You've got to be married before you get divorced. No one wants to get married. They just want to date forever. You know, they want to date forever because they're like, oh, marriage is an institution. It fails. What, and I've always asked people this, right? So whenever I'm talking to someone from my generation, I'm like, what would ruin the, so what about marriage would ruin the relationship? What about standing up in front of your friends and family and saying, I want to love this person forever would ruin the relationship? Why would that ruin it? And they're like, I don't know. It just would. You know, like they, they have no good answer, but they're like, I, I don't know. It's just, cause, and, and if they were honest, you know, the real answer is, because then you'd have to commit. Then you'd have to commit and you'd have to die. And you'd have to say, my life is no longer about me, it's about you. And especially when these couples have like three kids together. I'm like, well, come on, man. You know, like you're, you obviously are, are committed. Like why wouldn't you do it? It's because of that fear. I don't want to commit. I don't want to risk my finances and my life for this other person. That's why there's a lot of people in my generation also who are kid-free, right? I think it's about 60% of my generation considers themselves kid-free, it means that it's not that they can't have kids, it's that they never will. They won't even consider it. Now, in and of itself, that's not a necessarily evil thing, but if you ask them why, they're saying, because I want to have adventures and have fun, and I don't want some kid taking all my money. And once again, you're right. If the Bible's wrong, you're right. But if it's better to give than to receive, you holding on to your life and what you want is damaging you more than anything else would. You're not free. You're miserable because you don't understand the blessedness of love. Love is the supreme good and it is the supreme joy. Now, there's also a problem with love. So I, I said that there's an importance, there's a profit to it, but there's also a perfection to love and there's a way to love. So when we go through verse 4, so a lot of people, when they come to 1 Corinthians 13, they skip right to verse 4 and they read through verse 7. And you have to understand that what's being described here, it says in 1 John 4, verse 8, God is love. That's what it says. And when Jesus gives the first and greatest commandment, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Here's what they're saying. Here's what these passages are saying. If you loved like this, you would be perfect. That's what they're saying. And now I'm going to do a little bit of logical rationale for you. Since you're not perfect, you don't love like this. That's the logical conclusion. The only way you could say, no, I totally love like that, is if you're claiming you're perfect. And if you're perfect, good on you. Go be perfect. You know, continue to be perfect. Let everyone bask in the glory of your awesomeness. You need not learn anything else. But before you assume that, ask your loved ones if you're perfect at this. <laughs> if you say, well, what do they know? Well, then you're not perfect. Because <laughs> you know? so, love has to care about somebody else more than yourself. So this is a perfect thing. And when we look at perfection, there's two foolish ways to look at perfection. When the Bible gives us commands like this. The first foolish way is God gives me this standard so I will be able to do it. I will be able to do it because why would God command me to do something that I could not do? And the answer is God makes all sorts of demands of us that you'll never do. 
God also commands that you come back from the dead. Can you do that? You can't do it, but God will do it in you. And you will not be perfect in it here, but you will be one day. And if you look at this passage and you say, I will be able to do this. I will be able to do this. In my own power, in my own strength, I'll be able to do this. You are setting yourself up either for incredibly arrogance field delusion in which you really believe you're doing this, even though you're not, and you have to actively ignore and attack anyone who says different. Good luck. Or you're going to become increasingly miserable as you feel the weight of these commands crush you. The other foolish way to look at it is to say, well, if no one can do it, then why try? You see, this is just an expression of God's perfect love, and that's the love he has for me, but I'll never be able to do it, so I'm not even going to try. That's also stupid. What the Bible is telling us to do is it's saying, this is the love that loves you. Notice what Paul says, if I do all these things, but what? Have not love, I am nothing. If you don't possess love, if you don't know, to put it another way, that you're loved with this love. Verse four through seven is how God loves you. It's personal. It's for you. If you don't know that, then when you approach this text, you'll go one way or the other, but you won't go the right way. Only the Christian who knows this, like stands in awe of these verses and says, this is how God feels about me. This is how God treats me. This is how God loves me. Once you've been in awe, once you've been awed and humbled by that truth, then you can joyously imitate and find joy in the mere act of imitation, even if it's imperfect. I think about my daughter. You know, she's learned how to walk. And man, you know, from an objective perspective, she's not very good. But you never know looking at her face. She's never like fallen over like, oh gosh, I'm terrible. I can never do anything right. And like complaining. She just gets back up, starts laughing. She does it again. She loves it. Even the failure is fun for her. It doesn't keep her from trying. It always inspires her to try harder the next time. Why is she able to do that? Because kids never feel judged. They don't feel any shame. There's a good part and a bad part to that, but they don't feel any shame. They don't feel like people are judging them. They are so convinced of their goodness and their value that no matter what, when they're around adults, they just assume that they're the center of attention because they usually are. And because of that, they fearlessly and shamelessly try things and fail and get back up and try them again. You know when kids stop doing that? It's around the age of four or five. And psychologically, that's when kids start experiencing the nifty emotion of shame. Once they start experiencing shame, fear of failure consumes them and it's hard for them to try because they feel judged. Now again, remember I said in the beginning of the sermon, that's why a lot of people in our culture define love as acceptance, supreme acceptance, and they think that deals with shame. Okay. An argument that someone can make is we're just not trying hard enough. Fine, good on you, but we're trying pretty hard and people still have shame. People still have shame. No matter how hard we try to celebrate people and accept them, they're still anxious, they're still depressed, they still have self-hatred. And what that points out to me is it points out unconditional acceptance, first of all, is impossible for man to do. But secondly, unconditional acceptance for man will never settle the heart of another man. We need something more. It is the unconditional acceptance of our Father that gives us the capacity to try and to fail and to try again, to see joy in imitation, as opposed to feeling a weight and a shame in trying and failing. That's why a lot of Christians don't even read this passage. The ones who are arrogant and deluded, they would never read this passage because they think they're already doing it. The ones who feel like junk all the time would never read this passage because they've read it, they would feel even more like junk. They'd be like, I'm not doing it here, I'm not doing it there. They'd feel terrible. We're supposed to go to this passage often to understand loving others is not a natural phenomenon. You know, it's so weird how when I do marriage counseling with other people, they're, they almost, in the counseling, lie about their relationship. I'm like, you're here for help. What, would you lie to a doctor? Right? If you went to the doctor and you had cancer, would you go to the doctor and say, oh, I feel great, out of fear of shame? 
No way. Why would you lie in a condition and in a position where you could be helped? Because you're so afraid of not measuring up. You so think, I should have this down, that it's embarrassing to admit that you don't. Like I gotta tell you, if you feel it, I feel it. I'm a pastor. People assume I got this stuff down. Like, that's why Peter's teaching, because he's got it down. Wrong. That's not why I'm teaching. I am teaching because I'm being taught. It's because I'm trying to learn these things better and better in my own life. And I need to be in the Word, and I need to be growing. And I have been given a gift to be able to explain things in teaching in a capacity and way that other people cannot. That's why I teach. But it's not because I do it. Whenever you listen to a pastor and you think they're doing it, that's why they're teaching, you've missed the whole point of church. We're here to build one another up. I have gifts. I'm using them right now. But I need your gifts to help me do this. That's an important facet of my life. The number one shame that I've actually seen, though, is parents with their kids. If you want someone to see someone get mad, question their parenting. Now, if you understood, I don't do this. This is not something I do. And someone corrected you when it came to your parenting, you'd be able to receive it. You'd be like, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm learning. I'm trying to do better. But you certainly wouldn't respond and be like, how dare you? I am the perfect parent. I've never messed up. You're moving into arrogance. You're missing it. Love is not natural. And therefore, we shouldn't be ashamed of the fact that we're failing at this. We should instead have the capacity and the foundation to be able to move forward in this without shame. So because I took all the time talking about that, I'm only going to go over one. And it's probably the most important one anyway. Love suffers long and is kind. Some people break that into two. They say love suffers long and love is kind. It's not. It's one statement. And this statement tells us everything about love. Some people can misinterpret me and say, oh, well, because love is so joyous, therefore it's, so, it's pain-free. The first thing that Paul says about it is love suffers long. And how do you know you're actually acting in love? You remain kind. You suffer long and you remain kind. To love another person, to truly love another person, is to die daily. It's to deal with faults and failures. It's to deal with shame, misapprehension, miscommunication, argumentation. It's to deal with all sorts of horrible things. And if you don't know how to suffer long with somebody and remain kind, that relationship's not going to last very long it will turn contentious very quickly. We shouldn't go to other people in other relationships and expect them to be perfect because that would be loving someone not unconditionally, but conditionally. You love them because they're so good. God bids you to love the unworthy because that's what he does. He loves the unworthy. And remember I said, this is how God loves you. You ever think about that? God suffers along with you. C.S. Lewis said, put it this way, he said, God is the only host that actually designed his own parasites. It's true. When you understand that, you realize God loves me, but he suffers with me. He suffers with my failure. He suffers with my ignorance. He suffers with my foolishness, but he's kind. He's kind through it all. He never gives up on me. He never loses patience. God suffers long and is kind. So we think about our relationships. We take every single one of these and we look at it and say, how am I doing with this one in my marriage? Do I remain kind when I'm suffering long with my spouse? Or am I provoked easily and get angry and attack when I feel attacked? That's what I do. Do I suffer long with my daughter? Or do I feel like, gosh, she's waking me up again. Do I suffer long with my friends? Do I suffer long with God and trust that his plans are always for the best? Do I suffer long with my enemies? Or would I rather pray for their condemnation and their death than to go outside of myself and to reach out to those who so vehemently 
and maliciously oppose me in my faith? Do you suffer long with the world or have you grown cold in your love towards the world? It's so easy. You know, this year I've noticed it in myself more than ever before. I've looked at it at the world and been like, gosh, I don't even want to share my faith. <laughs> I don't even want to talk. It's just so ugly. There's so much hatred. There's so much deception. I don't even know if I want to talk to people who disagree with me. My love's growing cold. Jesus died for those who hated him. And he did it joyfully. This is a supernatural action, as I said. It's not something you can do in your own strength and power. This is what God wants to do in you and in me. Love will remain forever. We have to believe that. We have to trust that. We have to pursue it. Love is the greatest good and the greatest joy. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for, once again, your word, for how beautiful and amazing it is. It enlightens us more than anything else. So God, as we approach this, this is, this is hollowed ground. This is beautiful. This is not just a mere description of how love looks. It is a description of your divine character. This is how you are, always, at all times, and towards all people. Please, God, help us not to believe foolishly that we can somehow do this in our own strength, but help us also not to throw it aside because we feel inadequate to even try. Help us to understand that we are loved. We are so loved by you, God. And allow that love to undergird us, to give us the motivation, the foundation of peace necessary to try to love others in the same capacity and way. To not fear failure, but to learn from our mistakes and always move closer. We love you, God, and in your name. Amen.